Hi everyone, we're just doing a quick check to make sure it's live streaming properly and then we'll start in a minute. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Thumbs up? Great. Yes. Um, it feels pretty late in the game to be saying Happy New Year, uh, but uh, this is the first time this advisory group has come together in 2023. So welcome and Happy New Year. I am absolutely delighted that this meeting could proceed in spite of the nasty weather. I know um, in my office, we were looking forward to getting the whole gang back together again in person since it's been a few months. But um, here we are, and we're still here able to have a, a very important presentation and a useful discussion of this group. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, most of you, if not everyone, has had a chance to see uh, the really great column that our Director of Housing, uh, uh, Director of Housing Initiatives, Bartek Staradai, had in this week's uh, Daily Freeman talking about the rezoning process and why it's so urgent. And I think, uh, you know, we've all heard the governor talking about the need for rezoning as well, the need to really create housing. At the same time, uh, you know, we've had many public engagement sessions around our rezoning process, but as far as I know, and, you know, Bartek, please, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's been any public discussion of dispensaries, consumption lounges, or uh, personal cultivation regulation during our extended um, public engagement uh, process. So this is great. I'm really excited it's happening. For all of our public viewers, I know we have a number of folks who are on now, people who will view this later. This, is, this task force is not a decision-making body. Right. This is not one of our boards and commissions that takes votes and, and, and then our elected officials follow uh, those those votes. This is a group of residents that cares very much about the issues of public health, public safety, economic opportunity and social justice surrounding the MRTA's implementation process. Um, Again, our elected officials actually have a pretty narrow bandwidth in which to exercise their discretion over these issues. But the one area that is within our grasp is the one that uh, we're all here to talk about tonight. So I know um, I speak for all of the folks who appointed the members of this board, that everyone is enthusiastically awaiting your feedback. Um, and that discussion doesn't end tonight. If you have more thoughts, feel free to continue emailing them, sharing them. And uh, Bartek is also going to talk about opportunities to share them during uh, our, our additional processes for finalizing this rezoning. So that's why we wanted to make uh, this Zoom available to others, not just this, uh, the members of this advisory group. And I do not want to take up more time from this agenda. So I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan and Marissa uh, to continue with tonight's discussion. But thank you all very much. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and I really would like to echo a lot of what's been said already. We are very happy to 
have our task force back together, even if it's in virtual form. And we really were looking forward to doing something in person here. But I mean, at this point, hindsight's 2020. And yesterday, things were looking a bit dangerous. We wanted to err on the side of caution. I also see that Essie's here. So I'm just going to quickly promote her. Is that working? Hopefully. There we are. OK. Um, so just to start off with, because we do have a number of members of the public here, and I just want to provide a little bit of context so that everyone's on uh, starting on the same footing, just going to very quickly go over what we're doing here, kind of what we are looking at, um, and where we're hoping to go. So let's see here. Now is my screen coming through all right? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So as I said, for our task force members and probably many people, this is going to be largely review, but just to get us started off quickly. Um, this, as has been mentioned, is a meeting of the Kingston MRTA task force. The MRTA is the New York State Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. Uh, it's been in effect for, uh, well, since March of 2021 now, but why we're interested in having these meetings now and having these conversations now is because we are just starting to see the first rollout of legal adult use cannabis facilities, meaning uh, dispensaries, meaning consumption lounges, uh, delivery services, things like that. Um, so what we are looking at now is just sort of how we want to position Kingston within the scope of our authority to, uh, to manage this process and really ensure that we are respecting the wishes of the community, the needs of the community, and trying to do this in a way that's as equitable as possible. Um, so already uh, with the act going into effect, uh, recreational cannabis use has been legalized throughout the state, um, but the act also created the State Office of Cannabis Management to issue regulations and licenses for uh, facilities that will be selling this. And again, that's the stage that we're coming into now. So I mentioned before that this is a state law. This is also a state regulatory regime. So there are things that Kingston can do and things that Kingston can't do. Um, if we were to say that we did not want these facilities in Kingston at all, there was an initial period where the city could opt out and the city chose not to do that. So for that reason, we are moving ahead, allowing uh, both retail facilities as well as on-site consumption facilities. Similarly, uh, licenses for these facilities go through the state. So Kingston can't come in and say, you have to do this to get a license. We can't say that we're taking your license back. We can't do that sort of thing. What we can do uh, is express an opinion to, to the state agency issuing licenses, uh, offering an opinion on the license itself, uh, our license is applied for. And really the subject of what we want to focus on tonight is we can pass regulations on when these facilities can operate, roughly where they can be located, things like that that we can reach through our zoning code uh, and other, other regulations of that sort. Um, so that's really hopefully what we want to get into tonight with, again, Bartek Stardai, our detector, uh, excuse me, detector, yeah, director of housing initiatives who's also on the Zoom. <clears throat> and just to kind of broadly sketch out what our goals are here for tonight. Uh, again, we want to explore these options that we have at our disposal for regulating these facilities when they arrive in Kingston, which will be very shortly in all likelihood. Um, we want to discuss how the new, uh, new citywide zoning code will relate to and regulate these facilities once they begin to appear. We want to be prepared before then, but looking at how that will work. And we also want to gather public input as much as we can for the task force to continue considering as they uh, continue with their deliberations with providing their recommendations to the mayor and the common council. So questions, comments, all that will be welcome tonight. But as Barbara mentioned, this is really not a time when we are going to be coming to any final decisions. It's just keeping the, dis uh, the discussion moving forward. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And before we turn things over to Bartek here, who has a quick presentation prepared on what the uh, new zoning code is going to look like and uh, what we are considering there, um, 
So yeah, Mar Marissa, did you have anything that you wanted to add here? Um, first of all, just to double check that everyone can hear me and that I'm not having audio issues. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, welcome back to our task force members. I hope everybody is warm and safe tonight in light of the weather that we have going on. Um, unfortunately, we were stymied once again from providing you guys with in-person refreshments at a meeting, but um, we will definitely, hopefully be able to do that um, the next time we all get together um, in person. Um, before we turn things over to Bartek, um, Marissa, I, was... I think we might have lost your audio. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's still doing whatever it was doing or if I'm back. Yep, you are back. Okay. Um, was just saying that before we turn things over to Bartek, I was just going to quickly run through um, the set of discussion questions that the task force was tasked with coming up with recommendations for by the mayor and the council, just to kind of orient us um, back into our mission to find answers to those questions and kind of review a little bit of um, what we've talked about in the past. Um, the first one of those questions was um, what actions you would like to see the city take based on how cannabis prohibition affected the, you, your family, and your community. Um, in the past, we've talked about um, the issue of finding people, both who've been harmed by prohibition in the past so that we can help them get access to um, the jobs and other opportunities that will be coming out of these facilities coming here, and also just finding people in general to start um, educating people about recreational use and how that's all going to work. Um, another question that ties directly into what Bartek's going to be talking about is what hopes do you have for how the city is going to integrate retail cannabis establishments? Um, and in the past, we talked about the need to create buffer zones between um, the businesses and schools and possibly other sensitive areas and what we want to do to regulate del regulate delivery services. Um, another question that that we've talked about is what supports w or will organizations need to take advantage of grants and other support that's going to be made available through uh, cannabis-related tax revenue. Um, that ties into the Community Grants Reinvestment Fund that we've talked about before, which will award that money back to qualified nonprofits and also hopefully to the city as a qualified municipality. We still don't know a lot about how that's going to work since the Cannabis Advisory Board is the fund administrator and they haven't really done a whole lot of work to date on that to let us know how that's going to operate, but that's something that's out there and is coming. Um, another question we've talked about is what do you hope the city will do to support local residents and small businesses? And a concern that we heard from you guys there was making sure that we prioritize those folks over large corporations as much as we can. Um, another question we've talked about is what steps the city should take to ensure that community health and safety is prioritized while we're allowing recreational use. Um, along those lines, we've talked about the need to make lounges comfortable and safe for people to use, um, and also the need to really look at how the city can help lounges succeed in light of the fact that I think we've talked about lounges and other jurisdictions um, running into some challenges and maybe not being as successful as, as they could be. Um, something we haven't talked too much about yet is how city residents can respect the interests of those who oppose cannabis and public consumption. Um, another question on the list is regarding concerns and suggestions about the effect of recreational use on traffic safety. Um, another safety related question we've talked about is steps that we want to take to help teens make smart health and safety choices, which is something I think Bartek may be able to touch on a little bit for us when he discusses zoning in relation to signs and advertising. Um, another kind of sub concern we've talked about there is making sure that messaging on signs and advertising is effective. We've talked about how kind of a just say no, like strict abstinence type of approach hasn't necessarily been effective. And so we want to look at other ways that we can do that. And finally, um, there was, we have kind of a catch all question that just looks for any other goals that you guys might think the city should look at as it brings um, recreational cannabis use to its residents, and you guys have mentioned the need for the city to be as transparent as possible. So 
in light of that, that's certainly one of the reasons that we wanted to have Bartek come and talk to you guys tonight about the, the zoning changes that are upcoming. And um, I guess without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Bartek so that he can talk to you about that. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, as Jonathan and Marissa mentioned, uh, my name is Bartek Stardai. I'm the Director of Housing Initiatives for the City of Kingston. I've been in this role for about a year now, so I'm a year in <clears throat> uh, with the city. And one of the primary uh, focus areas of mine has been the rezoning of the city. Uh, some, I have about a 10-minute presentation for you tonight. The first five minutes is a background on the zoning process. And then the, the other half of the presentation um, is a look at how cannabis is currently treated uh, within the proposed zoning code. And I'll show you some uh, maps uh, uh, of the implications of how it's currently defined. So, um, you know, the last time Kingston had a rezoning uh, was the 1960s. Um, and so, uh, you know, think of this as a, a as a generational change, and the zoning code that uh, is eventually passed will certainly impact all aspects of life in Kingston, uh, you know, for the next fifty to one hundred years. The process of rezoning uh, began back in uh, two thousand and twenty one. Uh, and, you know, we've tried to have community engagement and public engagement on the process um, uh, since the beginning uh, with the visioning for what um, the, uh, the code should be. And we've had um, two full drafts um, that have been submitted for public review. And based on that, we've submitted a, a quote unquote final draft to the Common Council uh, back in uh, November of 2022. There were um, many different formats that we used to collect public feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, we made every effort uh, to um, respond to that feedback and then uh, as well as uh, make changes in the actual zoning code uh, based on the feedback received. Now, there were a lot of issues that came up uh, uh, with the public engagement regarding to parking, uh, to short-term rentals, uh, corner stores, uh, housing, uh, cannabis um, has not been an issue that has come up so far uh, in the uh, public engagement or the public discussion uh, uh, around the rezoning. And I think that's partly why tonight's conversation is so um, important. I just want to give you a little bit uh, of a brief overview of the goals of the rezoning. Uh, and these uh, big ideas, so to speak, uh, came from the community uh, community engagement process at the very beginning. Uh, so uh, number one, um, we're trying to make it easier uh, to have smaller uh, uh, and more simple development uh, throughout the city of Kingston. And, and that's partly by uh, improving and simplifying the approvals process for new development. Uh, we're trying to uh, better the building to street relationship uh, with new development. Um, so that encourages uh, walkability because you have new development that fits the context of any surrounding neighborhood. Uh, housing affordability uh, is uh, paramount, of course, and there's a desire uh, for a, a wider variety of housing types in Kingston and encouraging the development of those uh, housing types. And then, of course, uh, there's a desire for new development that supports sustainability. Uh, and uh, what I have typed here, a green resilient uh, future uh, for Kingston. Three other uh, big goals, uh, uh, street design and walkability. Uh, parking is a, uh, another goal. Uh, and now allowing enough um, a parking to support business activity, but not requiring too much, which might discourage um, development. And then finally, the current zoning code, uh, if you ever looked at it, it's quite confusing. Um, so we're trying to make the standards easier to understand and to use uh, from the end user perspective. 
I'm not going to go, in, go into this um, too much, but uh, what you have, if you look at the code, uh, this is the code mapped visually uh, onto the city of Kingston. That um, the darker purples that you see here are what we define as T5 urban center. These are the commercial hearts of Kingston, right? Where you have a mix of residential and commercial activity. And these are also the areas uh, that have the densest housing as well. As you move down, you have the, uh, the, the T4 neighborhood in blue, uh, the T3 neighborhood in light pink, uh, then the T3 large lot, and then you move into the greens, the conservation and natural areas. This is a continuum of um, from, ur from urban Kingston right to the more rural uh, parts of Kingston. And each of these colors or transect zones, as we call, call them in the um, new code, uh, they have you know, very particular um, uh, regulations within the code. And the reason why is because in contrast to the current code, what we're proposing is called a form-based code, all right? And what the form-based code allows us to do is regulate the physical form of the buildings and re their relationship to the street or the public realm. Uh, this includes signage, but you know any aspects of how um, a building uh, is masked, right? So where it's placed on a lot, uh, how tall it is, uh, what kind of uh, parking is, is, is allowed and where it can be located. Uh, and and so on. And uh, I'll get to why that's important um, at the end. So even though it's a form-based code and primarily, uh, you know, the, the focus of the code uh, is how development looks, there, it, we are still regulating uses. All right. And if you look in the actual zoning code, you'll see this table at the beginning. It's called the Permitted District Uses Summary. And this defines uh, within each of the transect areas what kind of uses are allowed. In terms of cannabis, um, currently in the zoning code as proposed, Cannabis is regulated within what we define as controlled substance sales. So this is lumped into alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. And there's a sales use. And then there's a separate sales and consumption use. So the sales use, the first one here would, of course, apply to any dispensary. Uh, while the consumption use would apply to any um, lounge uh, for consumption. And I'll show you a, a, a visual of this uh, up in the next slide. But this is the, in red, the con controlled substance sales and the controlled substance sales and consumption uh, part of the code. And what you see here is uh, both categories, you know, we're primarily targeting uh, as being permitted in the T5 and T4 areas. And these are the areas of the city that I mentioned uh, earlier. These are, these are the, the areas which already have um, most commercial activity. These are also the areas with the highest density of residential housing uh, so far. The P that you see here is, is permitted. It's, it stands for permitted. And what that means is no special uh, approvals are needed uh, per, you know, uh, for that use in that district. The SP stands for special permit. And any special permit will always have to go before the planning board for approval. Um, uh, that's the, administratively, that's uh, quite clear. So now, Can you see this map right here? I just want to make sure. Okay, great. So this is the 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 chart that I just showed you um, mapped onto the city of Kingston. Um, and I'm going to X out of this. So currently, uh, 
cannabis sales would be allowed in the areas of the city that are highlighted right here. What I'm going to do though, is I'm going to take away the special permit areas. These are the areas of the city where sales uh, would be allowed by right, meaning no, no special approval by the planning board would be needed. Now I'm going to move to consumption sites. So these are the areas of the city where consumption sites would be allowed. And then I'm gonna take away the special permit areas. These are the areas of the city where consumption sites would be allowed without needing any special permit, meaning they would be allowed by right. So you can see uh, the, you know, we're being more restrictive in the consumption sites um, in terms of where they would be allowed, uh, especially by right. All right, I can give I can go back to those charts uh, during the discussion, but I did want to quickly bring up uh, agriculture and cultivation as well. So in the zoning code, we are proposing to regulate agriculture and urban agriculture. Uh, we uh, the definitions are quite general. Uh, so cannabis would be, you know, if one was to cultivate cannabis, they would be generally allowed within these definitions. You can see here that we are quite permissive in terms of where urban agriculture is allowed. Uh, generally throughout the uh, entire city, uh, it's allowed and only allowed in, via special permit in the, you know, the, the areas of highest density. Uh, so, you know, T5 Main Street, this would be along Broadway, right? It's special permit because one, a goal for the city is to encourage uh, development, commercial development um, in, instead of agriculture in these areas. Agriculture, because these are, agriculture is defined as, you know, um, several acres uh, and these are larger operations. We're restricting agriculture in the higher density areas, right? The purple and the blues. And primarily they're permitted uh, by right in the least dense areas. These are the large lot areas and then the, the green areas, the conservation uh, and natural areas. And I'm gonna show you that on the map. Um, so these are the areas these are the agriculture areas um, that are currently allowed uh, in the new zoning code. And then I'm going to take away the special permit. Yeah, this does not include, so this is the by right uh, area. Now, the point I want to make about agriculture is that uh, there's, there's no restrictions in terms of cultivation on cannabis. Uh, in the current zoning code. So, um, you know, should we put in place any kinds of restrictions on, on cannabis cultivation or should we leave it as, as is, um, which is the general definition of urban agriculture and agriculture. And then if, if there's a need for any additional setbacks for that cultivation, uh, these are good questions that have not come up so far in the uh, engagement around the zoning code that we've had. And that is it for my overview. Okay. Yeah, uh, wonderful. Th thank you again, Bartek. Um, so uh, at this time, I'd really like to open it up to uh, our task force, uh, task force members with uh, any questions, comments, um, really anything you would like to start off the discussion. You entirely have the floor. Just feel free to unmute. Um, and if you're not getting a word in, just raise your hand or something have, uh, and we'll figure it out. I have something to say before we even begin as a sort of a prelude to the, the whole discussion, 
Uh, as of right now, there is not going to be any lounges or dispensaries in the Hudson Valley um, due to a lawsuit by some big cannabis company out of state who wants to be in Brooklyn, the Hudson Valley, Western New York, the Finger Lakes District. So those places will have nothing until this lawsuit is settled. So going forward with this meeting, you should know that this is all going to be when, whenever this is settled. And I see Jeremy's got his hand raised. So let's uh, get him in. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that presentation. It's very clarifying. Um, my first question for zoning uh, consum social consumption uh, lounges, uh, when that happens, we've discussed previously, um, you know, concerns about driving uh, while intoxicated, which is, of course, a concern with the other uh, the the other drug that I will not speak mm -hmm. of uh, that already has consumption lounges open. Um, but uh, would it? And see, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling on. But the restriction for um, those lounges, and I wouldn't want to harm the economics of anyone trying to come in and open that in Kingston, but to encourage walkability and uh, you know people who live in the more dense part of Kingston uh, to use to not drive, which should, should there be a consideration of restricting it to only the densest avenues or parts of Kingston rather than allowing potential special permits for areas farther out of the, the densest zones where everybody is already going uh, to bars uh, and going out to restaurants as well to keep them on Broadway, uh, uh, uptown, um, downtown. I just want to say I I did pull up the map um, of the areas that you know for consumption. You know the um, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm on the other hand, uh, you know by allowing some of the consumption sites throughout the city, the consumption sites would be more walkable uh, to more residents uh, of the city. Uh, so that's just one point I'd like to make. Uh, I also see Joe's guy's hands, hand up. So uh, by all means, just hop off. Hey guys, I just want to uh, point out one major concern of mine as we talk about signage and marketing and such. <clears throat> the main purple drag here is right down the same corridor that all the high school students walk and the high school is right in the middle of that zone um so on my end of looking at this all i'm picturing is you know colorful gummy bear signs and lounges and you know kids getting lost on the way to school i don't think that's going to happen um, first of all, there's going to be um, regulations on packaging, so there won't be any child-looking gummy bears. And number two, a kid can't walk down Broadway home from school and go into a bar or a liquor store either. They're going to card them. They're not going to let a kid in. The same, they're not going to let a kid in a dispensary or a consumption lounge. That's wishful thinking. I don't see kids going in bars. I mean, I don't know if you've been in Manhattan or Brooklyn lately, but That's there's me weed on counters everywhere. Oh no, there's definitely weed on counters. We're talking about Kingston though. And if there's gonna be dispensaries that are legal and, and consumption lounges that are legal, they're gonna have people at the door carting everybody and they're gonna not let kids from high school in. At first. Yeah, well, it's That's the same as with, um. Just like the city for at, bars, you know. Uh, yeah, but just like the city at first, that was it. But then it just turns into a free for all. All I'm saying is, if we do what you're saying, I agree 100. If it's run properly and 
uh, the kids are turned away. That's great. But at the same time, uh, it is a business and it is competition. And whoever is running that place, whether it be a bodega or a legal cannabis shop, um, you know, they're all fighting over the same customers and new customers, just like tobacco and just like alcohol. Well, uh, yeah, while we're on this topic, I'd really like to encourage any of the other task force members to come off mute and share any thoughts that they might have on this. Uh, I see Steve's got his hand up, so. Yeah. Um, uh, I still have the same, uh, uh, a major question for me is, is still unresolved about what, shouldn't the police, uh, city police be involved in this? Uh, and how are they involved in this? And what what's the communication uh, around this matter i mean are they going to uh, are, are they going to make a high priority of enforcing uh, the state's regulations i mean and how are they going to do about it uh, how are they going to go about it what are what are the city regulations on surveillance uh again this is this is an area where we do have some discretion so if there are potential things that you might want to see in terms of guidelines for that sort of enforcement. That's, that's certainly an area for discussion. Well, what uh, we can make recommendations as to how the police should conduct themselves. Uh, uh, potentially. Wow. Uh, that seems like a key central question here. I mean, whatever rules and regulations we make up, you know, who's going to enforce them and how? I mean, if it was a sheriff, I might feel a little better. You know, he seems to have some kind of, uh, he seems to be fairly uh, enlightened in his thinking on some matters anyway. But uh, so at some point, uh, don't we have, we need information from the police about how, you know, what their plan is, you know, what are they planning? Uh, this actually could be something we might um, explore in the future if we were to get uh, potentially someone from Kingston Police to participate in a discussion with the task force and sort of develop that further. That's something that we could look into setting up if there's interest. It seems I did, um... it's essential. I did have a meeting with the uh, sheriff and um, he told me that aside from DUI, they're not gonna make any cannabis arrests for low level cannabis usage in, in Ulster County, except for driving while under the influence. Yeah, except, except for DUI and underage consumption, which by the way, for all of you, you should know that there is a black market gray market still and people of any age don't get carded of course so the, just the, just keep keep that keep that in mind and so i'm hoping the legal market uh will at least create a space where um where we can get you know beyond the gray and black market and away from criminalization of cannabis so you know uh, great for the police to protect the streets and make sure uh, that there isn't underage uh, consumption. But you know, a goal for a long time in the in the state for many cannabis activists, including myself, is to get the police as far away from cannabis as possible. Sure, I'm with you on that. I had one more question that I brought up, I think, in the first, um, our first meeting, which hasn't been discussed much and might not be applicable in a zoning context because we covered it in agriculture. Um, but I am still worried about medical cannabis patients uh, not being able to afford medication. And I would like to see the city and the county take an active role in helping uh, community members who live in denser parts of the city 
who don't have access to a backyard or a front yard with full sun have a space that is safe and licensed to be able to either grow their medical cannabis themselves or have a caregiver do it. Uh, because if you're if you're living in an apartment or or public housing, uh, and you have a bal- you just have a balcony. That's not enough sunlight to grow cannabis. You may not have enough uh, spare uh, income to afford the indoor growing uh, technology to grow indoor cannabis. Um, and so maybe to add to the list for a future non-zoning discussion. But I think, you know, if, if New York wanted, I mean, New York, if Kingston wanted to be really progressive on, on the medical marijuana front from, a, from an equity lens, uh, injustice lens, having a space for people who, who can't grow medical cannabis on their property to have a space for them to safely do so would be a very big step forward for uh, medical marijuana in our community and making sure patients have access to medicine. Sounds good. Okay, so as we sort of keep this discussion moving forward, um, I just want to take a brief minute uh, to ask if any of the public attendees um, who may want to offer comments would like to come off mute. Um, if you do, just raise your hand in the chat and I will unmute you for that. I see Ruben Lindo's got a hand up. Um, so I'm going to see if I can add you here. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I'm clear. Yes. First of all, let me just say thank you for hosting such an important meeting. Um, there's a lot of information going around. Um, myself, I'm a cannabis expert. I've been in the cannabis industry on the adult use legal side for nine years, uh, or excuse me, eight years. I've operated in 22 jurisdictions uh, statewide and in three international countries in cannabis and, and was one of the first African-American CEOs in this industry. Um, there's a lot of information that's being shared here. And, and one of the things that is very concerning is misinformation. Right, and, and I think that what you guys are doing is a great service to the community to get the information out to the community, but we have to be very uh, purposeful in the messaging. So, so I heard Stu uh, Chernoff say um, some things and I also heard uh, Joe Begant uh, raise his concerns. And, and I will tell you, I work directly with the New York State uh, Police Chiefs Association um, and I am a consultant to many of the local police agencies, including Kingston Police Agency, uh, working with them to educate them. What you're, Joe, what you're seeing in New York City, you're correct, is, is the wild, wild west. It's a free for all. And that comes from lack of enforcement and lack of guidance from the state. However, what you're going to see in Kingston and other municipalities outside of New York City is a very controlled cannabis market. And, and the threat of children getting cannabis is as likely as children walking into, like Stu said, a bar and getting served after school. Um, we've taken considerable measures at the state level and at the, at, 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 at the um, manufacturer level, like myself, in putting money towards two things, education and also protection, because we have to protect our most vulnerable of the community, which are children. When it comes to consumption lounges, I think we have a long way to go. Um, I own and operate a consumption lounge in, in downtown Los Angeles for many years, and it is a very difficult undertaking from a municipality standpoint because there's two issues at hand. One, the MRTA answered it, and it's access to the plant, the plant as medicine. The other issue is the general consumption and protection of Right? So if you have people walking around in the street, they can smoke cannabis anywhere. The idea of consumption lounges was to give people in public housing who, where it is still under the Controlled Substance Act because it's federally subsidized, a place to consume legally and responsibly. So I just wanted to chime in and say that, and I wanted to thank you guys. And I know that the work that you do is, is thankless and, and the community needs you guys doing what you do. So thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah, thank you, Ruben. That's really very helpful. Um, and that's great insight for us as well. Uh, while we have it open, are there any other 
public members who would like to offer any comments before we turn it back over to the task force for a bit more discussion, then we're, we're still aiming to wrap this up at our usual time of about 730. I see Andrew Lessig has a hand up, so I'm going to try and add you in and see if this works. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Coming through. All right, wonderful. So I'm Andrew Lessig, um, as some of you know, especially from Corporation Council's office. Um, I represent uh, uh, some property owners in uh, Uptown Kingston, specifically in the Stock K District. Uh, one thing we're just asking the task force to uh, keep in mind is uh, the the nature of the stockade district and some of the other overlay districts that currently exist in the current zoning in the city of Kingston. Obviously, the stockade district exists because there was a recognition that, you know, the the neighborhood in general um, has a you know the public has a special interest in it. It's not just the individual sites within the neighborhood; it's the nature of the neighborhood altogether as sort of, you know, the original neighborhood of Kingston founded by Peter Stuyvesant, you know, where John Jay held the first uh, session of the Supreme Court of New York State 240 years ago. Um, it, you know, the neighborhood has a specific historic character. It's, it's family friendly, it's educational, and perhaps this task force ought to look at whether or not marijuana lounges or marijuana consumption in that area, just like in a, in a park might be might be appropriate or might be off putting um, to uh, members of the public, uh, you know, who specifically come for the historic nature for the family friendly nature for the educational nature of that specific neighborhood in the city. Hey, uh, great. As, as someone who lived in, um, sorry, Jonathan, taking it away as someone who has lived in uptown um, before in my time at Kingston. Yeah, totally, totally get that, Andrew, that it's a special, it's a special place with a special history. And for someone like me, who is a cannabis consumer and not an alcohol consumer, there are a lot of bars in Uptown. I've had, I've seen a lot of wild things happen there. So, you know, to me, you seeing bet. cannabis, see, seeing cannabis in Uptown would be like a dream come true. No. So I, I would... I think that would draw people to Uptown because there's a lot of people like me who don't consume alcohol and don't want to be around drunk people, but would love to have great conversation and coffee with some stoned people. So I think it can only bring great things to Uptown. I mean, let's not pack like 20 consumption consumption lounges and in, in, into every you know nook and cranny of Uptown, but a couple would do us some real good. Real good. Yeah, and before I fully turn it back over to the task force, just a final call if there's anyone, uh, any public attendees who'd like to get in a quick word here. Um, and I do. None of... I do. Oh, you're, you're, you're the task yeah. force, Steve. Uh, oh, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so seeing none, I'm just going to move Andrew Lessing back over. Um, and now, I have a question for Andrew. Oh, yeah, certainly. Are you free to tell us specifically who your clients are? Uh, we shouldn't. We don't need to get into that particularly right now. Um, but we can just continue focusing the discussion on cannabis as it relates to zoning and the issues that were raised here. Okay. I, I would like to before you know we reach seven thirty. I would like to get any, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Jeremy. You had some feedback as it relates to the consumption sites, um, but you know, I think the the maps that I showed for the sales and for the consumption sites as well, because we are grouping this in the controlled con grouping cannabis in controlled substance uh, definitions. Uh, right, the maps are quite permissive. Um, and I just, I would like to get any, um, additional thoughts the task force might have, uh, from that look or any specific areas. We just talked about uptown, but, uh, we talked a little bit about Broadway. I mean, we only are going to get 
you know, because, and tell me, there are only a few permits for by region. And so there's a limited amount by region for our region is the mid -Hud mid Hudson or the Hudson Valley region. Um, we're a relatively small community. And so I, I feel like looking at your presentation about where dispensaries will be allowed seems to be in the right ballpark because how many dispensaries could we possibly support in the city of Kingston? I, I, I can't see more than three being viable. Um, but I wish that gentleman who uh, uh, has run dispensaries before could could pop back on and and give us some of his thoughts on that. But it seems like we're not like awaiting a massive flood of businesses coming in. But correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and just I mean, this is an informal discussion. So um, if there was a specific question that you wanted to ask to any of the public members. Yeah, totally. Uh, we could bring them back on. Um, just as we're kind of coming up on the end here, I really just want to encourage uh, any of the task force members that we haven't heard from yet. If you have any questions, any comments that you might've had on your mind, um, Amberly, Liz, um, definitely would welcome it. And I, I see Ruben has his hand raised again. So I'm I, also going to I was going to say, I asked that Ruben come back on. <laughs> Oh, I accidentally promoted you to panelist, but uh, I, I think that'll work for the end here. Oh, uh, you could, could you un unmute, please, Ruben? Where? I thought you were in control. Sorry, Jeremy. Yeah, um, it's, uh... <laughs> I, I thought you guys, um, again, thank you. Listen, I, the question that I heard was how many dispensaries um, could, a, could a municipality like Kingston have? And, and packing them in, that's always a challenge um, of boards like yours and, and the municipal planning board and, and zoning. You know, typically the, the question always comes up, how many is too many and how many is not enough? And, and generally speaking, in a city the size of Kingston, I think that it would be prudent for folks to take a look at the time, place, and manner code and the distances from things, i.e. high school and public meeting place that the state has designated and figure out how to adequately sprinkle those. Again, it's about access to the plant less than revenue generated, um, especially in this early phase. Uh, the other thing about the number of dispensaries allotted, the state has not put a cap on the number of licenses they're gonna give out in any particular area. What you were referring to was the card, the conditional adult use retail, which is justice impacted folks, licenses. And those license holders, they've designated based on the number of people and the density and the population, they said that they would give the Hudson Valley a total of seven. We've pushed back and said that the Hudson Valley could handle more than seven and the states heard us at, at a professional level and they're reviewing that. But again, as Stu said, we are all holding oars in our hand waiting for the Vicente ruling to be released. Um, and, and, and the word on the street is we should hear some positive uh, information about that in the next couple of weeks. It's, it's already been uh, presented to the Supreme Court for an injunction. And we feel that we have a judge uh, that is going to back the, lift the injunction and allow for the rollout of the program. Um, but as you may have heard me say publicly or, or read, I still believe that access to the plant is primary and the number of dispensaries should not be capped based on anything other than distance and proximity um, because we know what's gonna happen, right? If we don't have enough, we're gonna proliferate the legacy market. And then we're gonna run into what Joe is fearing. Um, people who are opportunists taking, taking advantage of gray area and loopholes. The other thing that I wanted to share is from a law enforcement perspective, um, I get calls all the time from every agency 
throughout the state on Ruben, what do we do? We have a car pulled over. We have this, we have that. We have these conversations and we play Monday morning quarterback. And the one thing that I can tell you is the MRTA has really hamstrung law enforcement from creating what we call uh, prohibition 2.0. So a lot of law enforcement agencies are taking a hands-off approach. The one thing that as a, as a board municipal group, you guys, if your interest is protecting children, they left a huge loophole in the fact that anyone can carry and possess this plant. And that includes minors because there's not a provision to stop minors. The only provision we have is education. And you guys are doing a great job on that. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Thanks again, Ruben. Hey, um, hi there. So, and Bartek, thank you for your amazing op-ed that was also on Kingston Wire. So thank you so much. Um, I, I have to look closer at the map that you had up before um, I screenshot it. And uh, I think it's, there's so many, there's so many avenues of discussion. Um, I, I don't think that what, you know, one of the things we talked about was um, you know, limiting people on how many they can grow and, um, and, you know, the agricultural zones and everything like that. And, um, I would steer away from that because I think that checking up on how many plants people are growing and everything is a whole other ball of problems. Um, and certainly taps into law enforcement and everything else, uh, that we would like them to stay as far away from cannabis as possible. Um, I, I love the discussions we're having. I think that as we continue down this road, that it might be advantageous to not only have like info sessions open to the public, but also maybe even create um, a brick and mortar, you know, freestanding info spot that people could, if they have questions, you know, they could go to this office and ask these questions or they could call or email, you know, a particular group of people that are accessible um and 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 i am all about transparency so um that's my number one thing so anyway i really appreciate every what everybody has talked about tonight i we've we've covered so much different ground um and it's it's so fascinating and ruben thank you so much really helpful um so anyway that that's it for me thank you yeah and uh and amberly some of the stuff Come on, echoing all some of the stuff you're saying was also echoing things that uh, Liz has mentioned in the past about that need for outreach and getting in the communities. So um, I, I think that builds naturally. Um, so we are roughly at time here. Um, I see Steve's got his hand up, so I'll get a final comment in from him, um, and we'll call it off for tonight. Um, as always, if you want to continue any of these conversations, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you need contact information for anyone, we can certainly provide that. Um, so. Uh, it should be a quick qu uh, question, easy to answer, I would think. Uh, the maps we were looking at, did they incorporate uh, what Ruben had to say about restrictions, about uh, proximity to schools and churches and that sort of thing? Did That's I miss that? Yep. Um, yes and no. So the maps do not reflect that, but they would supersede, right? Uh, they would take priority uh, over the zoning. Um, Jonathan Marissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but... You know, if, if a parcel uh, on the zoning map would allow for a dispensary, but it happens to be right next to a school, then of course that would not be allowed because of, uh, you know, those, uh, those other rules that supersede the local zoning code. Well, I think it would be useful to have a map that showed, you know, how that actually plays out. Right, putting an additional filter on the map, sort of. I will definitely look into that, see if that's, that that's possible. Thank you. All right. Uh, so with that, we are at seven thirty one now. Uh, I think this is a good time to pause the discussion for tonight. Um, again, yeah, as Liz was saying here, thank you, Ruben. That was very very insightful, and I think that really sparked a lot of good discussion. Um, so Ruben, also not to cut you off, he put his email in the um in the comments to make sure. Yeah. Excellent, and I can circulate that to the list as well. Um, so again, thank you so much for attending. Thank you to all of our members of the public who uh, participated despite 
technological issues here. Um, we look forward to hearing from you all again soon and doing something similar in about a month or so here. So thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Al.